So, chapter 19, following up on chapter 18, we're going to talk, continue to talk about the cardiovascular system, but now we're going to talk about the blood vessel, blood vessels, blood vessels of the cardiovascular system. So what are the blood vessels? Where the blood is. Well, who carries blood? We already know the heart is a pump, a four-chambered pump, a two-sided pump. Yes? But these are the distributors of blood through the body. So there's a difference between them, arteries and veins. How do we characterize arteries and veins? How do we define them? Arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood back to the heart. Okay? Some arteries, majority of them, carry blood that is what? Oxygenated. Not all, though, correct? Give me an example of an artery that does not carry oxygenated blood. Pulmonary artery. Yes? Veins typically carry deoxygenated blood, but not all. Give me an example of one that doesn't. The pulmonary vein, because that's bringing blood back to the heart from where? From the lungs. So, to who? The vena cava? Superior and inferior vena cava? No, that carries deoxygenated blood. That's a vein. Veins. Yes? Now, physically, the structure is different. And because of what's going on in both of these vessels, the structure has to be a little bit different. When I talk about an artery, I'm talking about something that has to be able to absorb pressure from the pump, especially the arteries that are closest to the pump. Veins, on the other hand, they don't have as much pressure in them anymore because pretty much they're kind of at the end of the line. Remember, this is a closed system when we talk about the cardiovascular system. So when we look at the cardiovascular system, the pump is connected to the tubes, arteries, and veins, and there's no end to the distribution line. The end of the line, or kind of the end of the line, where I'm going to distribute all of the materials, is the capillary beds. But they don't stop. They just continue on. They go from an artery to smaller, smaller, smaller arterioles. And then we eventually hit the capillary bed or capillary network. This is where exchange takes place. Those tubes will continue on, but then we'll start calling those tubes that continue on after exchange, what? They're not arteries anymore. They're, they're veins. So we have little, little veins, venules that eventually feed into larger, larger veins. So the pressure that was applied to the blood that's being distributed through the cardiovascular system is much, much less as it goes through the tubes much, much less after it leaves the arteries and goes into the venous portion. So we don't have to absorb as much pressure. So we look at the structure or the walls of these two different blood vessels in the cardiovascular system, and we see that the artery walls, the walls themselves, are much, much thicker than the walls of veins. Does everybody understand why? Why? The arteries, well, the heart pumps blood. Yeah, there's more pressure in the arteries, so they have to be able to absorb more of that pressure. You can feel that pressure wave from the pump flowing through arteries because it's still fairly strong until it hits the capillary beds. What is that called, that pressure wave that we can actually feel? It's called a pulse. That's not from the arteries. That's from the what? That's from the heart. So that pump, that pumping action is from the heart. So what we see 
when we look at the layers of arteries versus veins, is the layers are much thinner in veins, much thicker in arteries. And the other thing we're going to find to prevent backflow, similar to what we found in the heart to prevent backflow, is valves. We don't find them in the arteries because everybody's moving pretty, pretty quickly through the arteries. We, we're not going to get backflow because we prevent backflow in the heart with the valves there. If I lined you all up against the wall, or lined you all up in a line up that aisle, and I down here give you a big, huge push forward, say I lined you all up like this, one right after the other, and I gave you a big push, push the line at this end, the pressure that you would feel would be much greater at the beginning of the line than at the end of the line, wouldn't it? Hmm? It would stink for the person, people there. Up there, they'd just get a little shove, right? That's kind of what happens in the circulatory system. So pressure is going to decrease as we flow from artery to vein. And to prevent backflow, we're going to have valves in veins as well. Sometimes if um, you, you ever hit a valve, pain in the keister, isn't it? You can actually hear it flapping as you're trying to draw blood. Makes a little flutter, yeah. So, the layers of the walls. Tunica intima in the, in the center, touching what we call the lumen. What's a lumen? That's the space that flows through the, the vessels. So we have endothelium. What is that? What kind of cells? Epithelial cells that line the in in every time we have epithelial we have every time we have epithelial tissue we have three things that kind of go hand in hand epithelial cells with basement membrane and connective tissue subendothelial layer and when we talk about extra layers, we're going to see an extra elastic layer in the artery and not in the vein here that consists or, or makes up the tunica intima. That elastic, extra elastic, is going to allow for stretch. Is that the part with arteriosclerosis that stops? It's just like an old elastic. Exactly. Well, specifically, the elastic can't do its job, but yes, everything is kind of hardens. So when you, when you have atherosclerosis, we're not going to have that nice elastic opening that we get in a nice healthy artery. So we'll see that extra layer there, internal elastic membrane. Then we have the tunica media, which is typically some sort of smooth muscle. And depending on which artery or which vein we're talking about, we might have several layers in several different directions. So smooth muscle and elastic fibers make up the tunica media. Again, in the artery, it's going to be thicker than it is in the vein. And what else do we see in the artery that we don't see in the vein again? Another elastic, Another elastic layer. Allow for that stretch. Then the tunica externa, the covering, is basically collagen fibers, kind of like the outside of a hose. And both arteries and veins have pretty much the same outer covering. You're not seeing it? Well, you're not going to see those. Well, let me just point out something. In the histology slide, typically what you're going to see when you look at an artery versus a vein, it depends on what size we're looking at. So this could be a very small artery or a very large artery. For, they're not going to necessarily have all of these layers, and we're going to talk about that in the, in the textbook as well. But the nice thing about the histology slide showing you a side-by-side -side comparison is typically what you're going to see is the vein, because of the walls not being as thick, don't stay wide open and nice and round. They kind of collapse. And that's what this one has done. The artery, on the other hand, 
stays nice and round. Because of those elastic layers, the inner layer almost puckers when we, when we remove the tissue from the body and we make a slice of it. So think of an elastic. If it was in the body and doing its job, it would kind of be semi-stretched out. But if I'm not using it anymore, it kind of shrivels up on itself, pulls together. And that's what the lumen, the elastic, internal elastic membrane has done to the lumen there. And if you look at the lumen, we can only see a little slit of a space, but see all the little like jagged edges? That's kind of like the elastic, pulling short. Yep, yeah, it's pointing to the middle there. So when you go, um, not next, not this week, but next week when we look under the microscope at arteries versus veins, that's what you want to look for. You want to look for that little jagged internal edge versus something that's a little bit smoother but kind of folded on itself. So that's the difference between arteries and veins. The capillaries are very different because we're not going to have as many walls or tunica. Basically, all the capillary beds are are endothelial cells and basement membrane. Why do you think that's the case? So nutrients go easily between. Exactly. So nutrients can pass, waste can pass, exocytosis and endocytosis can happen at a rapid rate in the capillary beds. Because remember, everybody's going to keep moving. So it would be like me having to hand you something on the move. Ever run a race? And you, st and you don't stop at the little stations and take a drink and have a snack. What do you do? People, st people stand there and they hold them out to you. And as you run by, you grab a drink or you grab an orange, depending on what race you're running, right? And you keep going. That's kind of what the circulatory system is doing when it hands off its materials in the capillary beds. Things are going to slow down quite a bit when we talk about the capillaries. We'll see these little sphincter muscles that kind of slow things down in the capillary beds so that exchange can take place efficiently, but everybody's still going to keep moving. So this is an example of the closed system, the venous and arterial system. And the relationship between arteries and veins, and the other thing we're going to talk about in the next chapter, 20, the lymphatic system. When we talk about exchange in the capillary beds, we have diffusion, osmosis, exocytosis, endocytosis, all of that's going on in the capillary beds. And one of the things that is going to diffuse out or osmos out is what? osmosis, the movement of water, the diffusion of water. Remember that term way back when, chapter 3, chapter 2, can't remember what chapter it was? Water is going to leave the capillary beds as well, and it has to get back in. Well, it tries to get back in, but because everybody's on the move, it can't do it very efficiently. With the help of the lymphatic capillaries, which happen to be in those areas, around capillary beds, we're going to be able to get back some of the fluid that escapes the circulatory system, and we're going to be able to get it back into the circulatory system, but through the lymphatic system. So one of the things, one of the jobs of the lymphatic system, besides to help keep us healthy and house all those wonderful lymphocytes that we're going to talk about in Chapter 21, but it also is going to help us reabsorb or re-enter fluid into the circulatory system with the help of those lymphatic capillaries. So lymphatic system looks very, very closely related to the venous system, follows pretty much the same patterns, and then will eventually dump back into the circulatory system all of that fluid that it helps to reabsorb. So when we talk about lymphatic, we'll talk about that in detail. So there's different types of arteries depending on how close we are, how far away we are from the heart. So this is a closed system. We have the pump. The pump goes to the system, pumps, gives pressure to, pushes blood from, 
into arteries. And the first arteries that it's going to pump into are ones that have to be able to absorb the most pressure. We call these guys what? Elastic arteries. This little diagram on page 696, table 19.1, gives us a nice representation of what these different vessels actually look like or are composed of. So an elastic artery has a lot of what? Elastic. elastic tissue. So if we look at the elastic tissue content in an elastic artery, we see it's much higher than some of the other arteries further on down the line because it has to absorb most of the pressure from the push from the pump. We also see a good amount of smooth muscle. The endothelium pretty much never changes, even in the capillary beds, and that fibrous tissue that wraps on the outside gets a little bit denser in the muscular arteries, which are now next in line. And what does a muscular artery have more of? Muscle. Very good. You guys are wicked smart today. The other thing that changes is the lumen. And you notice average lumen diameter, D, and wall thickness, T. That's also included in this. So the lumen is going to change as well. Uh, the lumen's a little thinner in diameter, in, a, in diameter. In an elastic artery, it gets wider when it, it stretches out. Muscular arteries, what are they doing for me? They're going to help push, with a little muscular push, blood into different compar uh, compartments that it has to go in. So we're going to see some muscul mus muscle layers that we can actually help give a little push to blood in a muscular artery. Sometimes they refer to them as distributing arteries, because this is where I'm going to sort of branch out and give everybody blood that is needed. Does everybody understand that as we leave the heart, these blood vessels are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller? And they're going to branch more and more and more. It's kind of like the tree that's growing out of the, tr out of the ground. The trunk would represent the heart, and it's push out some of the major blood vessels. And then the branches are actually going to go to different parts of the body. So as we go through the, the branches, the vessels will get smaller and smaller and smaller. So muscular arteries are next in line. We call them distributing arteries. Then we get to smaller, the smaller end of the tree that we're going to talk about, into arterioles. And now what happens to the diameter and the thickness? Yeah, the diameter is getting small because the tube itself is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the thickness of the walls are much, much thinner in an arteriole. Everybody understands the measurements there? What's an mm millimeter? What's a um micrometer? How many micrometers in a millimeter? Thousand. Thousand. Very good. So those are much smaller with respect to the larger ones. So the larger ones, closer to the heart. After we pass the arterioles, we're then going to dump into the capillaries. And the capillaries is where we're going to get the exchange part of the whole system. So now what happens to the elastic tissue and the smooth muscle and the fibrous and all the, yeah, they're gone. They're not there. We just have a thin endothelial layer with a, a little tiny bit of wrapping, basically so we can have exchange. We look at the diameter, micro, nine micrometers. Thickness, 0.5 micrometers. Very, very, very small. Can you see capillaries? Yeah, under a microscope, maybe, exactly. So once exchange has taken place and we start back through the venous system, the tubes are now, again, going to get larger to deliver blood back to the heart. The first ones we see online are venules. And as they get larger, they turn into veins. Again, the diameter 
of the walls and the thickness and the lumen size are going to get larger as we go larger as well. So by the time we get into a vein, we have a diameter of five millimeters versus the diameter of an elastic artery, which is 1.5 centimeters. You see the difference? And then delivery of blood back to the heart. The other thing, pressure is gonna go way down. Yes? in the veins. Okay? So let's talk about capillaries. Not all capillaries are the same. Depending on what has to happen in any given area, we're going to see that there's several different types of capillaries where exchange takes place. Places like the blood-brain barrier, for example, where blood is carrying nutrients to who? the brain to make things like cerebrospinal fluid, we're going to have capillaries like the top guys. The top guys are called continuous capillaries. So if we actually look at the makeup of the capillaries, the endothelial cells are going to be continuous, side by side, wrapped in basement membrane. This way, the exchange that happens in these capillary beds is going to be very controlled. It's going to be up to those cells to take things from plasma, bringing them into those cells, and then pull out the other end to wherever I'm delivering to. What's that called? When a cell takes things in and then delivers out the other end. Do both begin with an E? Endo and exocytosis. So a lot of the movement of materials is gonna happen via endo and exocytosis through those endothelial cells. Very controlled, only exactly what I want to leave the plasma and enter into fluid surrounding the capillary beds. Please understand that surrounding capillary beds, there's gonna be fluid. <coughs> fluid that might um, be around the heart, for example or fluid that might be around the lungs, for example, or fluid that might be in a synovial joint, for example. So I'm gonna be delivering to that fluid. If I want things to move a little bit faster, but still not, you know, crazy fast, I might have capillaries called fenestrated capillaries. And movement is gonna be much quicker through this because there's little holes in the endothelial cells. Does anybody know what, um, how to say window in Italian? A window. A window. It's called a finestra. Yes? See, we, I just gave you an Italian lesson. So now there's little windows or openings or fenestrations in the endothelial cells of a fenestrated capillary. So we might find these in places like the kidneys, where filtering has to take place, or the small intestine. What happens there? Yeah, absorption of nutrients has to take place. So I might want to move things along a little bit quicker, and that's where we find the fenestrated capillaries. And the third type of capillary kind of looks like a total mess, doesn't it? Just a total mess. Big spaces between the endothelial cells, big holes in the endothelial cells. Pretty much anything it wants, anything can pass through here. Lots of fluid can pass through, maybe even cells. Where might we find sinusoidal big holes in bone marrow? Why? Because it wants to. No. You were on the, you were on the, tr yeah, remember in the bone marrow, that's where I have my hematopoietic stem cells, right? And when I induce them to mature into a red blood cell or a white blood cell or a platelet, where does it have to go? Into the circulatory system. So from the bone marrow, I can pass cells into the circulatory system, like mature red blood cells. 
in a sinusoidal type capillary. So depending on what kind of exchange has to take place where, we might find combinations of all three different types of capillaries in the capillary system. So continuous, nice and tight, endocytosis, exocytosis. Fenestrated, got some windows there, movement a little bit faster. And then the sinusoidal, kind of Swiss cheese-like, it can actually pass cells in through. So the capillary beds themselves have control. There's control over movement, and we try to slow it down a little bit when blood hits the capillary beds. Little sphincter muscles associated with the capillary beds are going to help channel blood in different directions. When we look at the true capillary beds, it's a series of little tubes that's going to help supply a space. Now what would happen if one of those little branches was blocked off or damaged? Would the whole area of tissue die? No, because we have a lot of other little tiny branches that service the same area. The term anastomosis refers to some of the branching of the circulatory system in the capillary beds and some of the other branches that service different areas. So when I need to supply nutrients to all those cells, say behind or around that capillary bed, the sphincter muscles open wide and blood travels through all of the little branches. But say I need to speed up circulation or I have a sympathetic response from the autonomic nervous system that tells me I need to speed up my circulation. What might happen to those sphincter muscles? Yeah, the sphincter muscles might close up and say, okay, we don't have time for that right now. We have to speed up. So we might get messages, hormonal messages or nervous system messages to close up those sphincter muscles and make a straight shot and maybe slow down service for a little while to an area. It's not going to happen forever, is it? Because what would happen to that tissue if it did? It would die. But in different circumstances, we'll see those sphincter muscles will help control how slow things travel through the capillary beds. So we have the end of the artery line, terminal arterioles, that feed into the capillaries. And then we have pre-capillary sphincters at the beginning of the capillary beds. And then the true capillary beds themselves. And the true capillary beds is where the exchange takes place. This is where we go from red to blue, or we go from what to what? Oxygenated to deoxygenated, or nutrient-rich to nutrient-poor, or from artery to vein. So this is where that gray area, the exchange area, comes in, and that's the true capillary beds. So again, those sphincter muscles are going to play a big role in regulating the rate at which things flow through those capillary beds. And once exchange has taken place in the true capillary beds, we're going to go on to the what system? We're still in the circulatory system. We were just in the arteria, um, arteries. Where are we going to go into now? Now we're going to change into the venous system. So after exchange has taken place in the true capillary beds, blood is going to continue to flow. What else happens in the true capillary beds besides dropping off oxygen and dropping off nutrients? I'm going to pick up waste products. Who am I going to pick up? Pick up carbon dioxide with respect to respiratory gases, and what else? What else does the blood carry? Not just good things. Yeah. Waste products, right? So we're talking about in the tissues now. Tissues are, undergo are going to undergo metabolism, and their waste products are going to be picked up in the capillary beds as well. So, then we're going to flow through these guys into the venous system. Now, because things are now under a lower pressure and moving a little bit slower, 
We find that, and you can see this diagram on page 699, figure 19.5, that most of your blood volume is in the venous system, about 60%, because it's a little sluggish. When we look at systemic arteries and arterioles, about 15% of blood volume is there, because they're moving pretty quickly through those. Pulmonary blood vessels, what's that? In the lungs, going for gas exchange, about 12% of blood volume. Heart, only about 8 and about 5% in the capillary beds. So most of your blood volume is going to be in the venous system, traveling back to the heart, basically. So venules are the first ones we see coming up. Those are the small, small veins that are right after the capillary beds and then we get into the larger veins. Because the pressure is lower, don't forget, we're going to see valves in veins, and that's going to help prevent backflow. But that's not the only thing that's going to help prevent backflow. The other thing that's going to help make sure blood gets back to the heart, like say, for example, down in the legs, and I'm standing up. I'm working against who right now? I'm working against gravity right now. I don't have a lot of pressure behind me. So how is blood going to get back from my toes to my heart? Well, everybody's pushing from behind. So I'm still going to get a little push from behind. And I have those valves to prevent backflow. But what if I could somehow apply pressure to my tubes? Maybe give them a little squeeze to help push things through. Maybe muscles can help me do that, too. If I'm standing up for long periods of time, and has anybody in the, ever been in the military and had to stand at attention for a very long time and not move? Do you know what happens to you when you do that? <laughs> you might pass out. How come? Yeah, a lot of that blood is pulling down in your lower extremities. So one of the tricks, does anybody know what the trick is for standing at attention? Move your feet inside your boots. So you can do what? Contract the muscles in your legs. Give a little push. So the other thing that's going to help push blood back to the heart besides the low pressure is what we call the muscular pumps in our body. There's another one right in your thoracic cavity. When you breathe in, expand the thoracic cavity, diaphragm moves, you push on the tubes. So you just breathing is helping getting blood back to your heart through the venous system as well. And again, we call that all the muscular pump. So it's important. And they talk a little bit uh, under homeostatic imbalances on page 600. Why can't I see today? 699. I think I need new glasses. Varicose veins. And that can happen due to the buildup in pressure. And a lot of times, if anybody's ever experienced this during pregnancy, which is one hell of a buildup of pressure for the circulatory system, we can sort of push those guys out of their little pockets and cause them to come to the surface. And that's what a varicose vein is. Yeah, and again, because of, of decrease in, in the, in the um, yeah, more pressure, De a decrease, why can't I, my brain can't think today. I'm thinking of Jamaica. <laughs> um, the integrity of connective tissue starts to degrade as we get older. The, uh, the content of collagen fibers, for example, starts to degrade as we get older. So th that's some of the stuff that's going to hold those tubes in place. And that, that's why we see an increase of things like varicose veins with age as well. So they talk about vascular anastomosis. And again, this is branches, making sure everybody gets what they need from the circulatory system. And anastomosis are little channels or little connections that are going to help make sure all of the areas of our body are serviced by the circulatory system. 
So it's very important to understand that we get branches or anastomosis in the in the the tree we call the cardiovascular system with respect to the blood vessels so that everything can flow to where it needs to flow. So there's arteries that anastomose, branch off, connect to others. When we get more tissue, we create more anastomoses. Why, why might we get more tissue? When would we get more tissue? When would we get more tissue? When, you, when you're growing, right? So as you grow, your vessels are going to anastomose to make sure everybody's serviced. You can continue to branch to service all your cells. How about if you get more tissue when you're older? Gain some weight. You, you add what? You add adipose tissue. All that adipose tissue needs to be serviced by the circulatory system, correct? So your blood vessels have the ability to create more of these branches. And the nice thing about it is when one branch might get a little clogged up, because I have the ability to create all of these branches, I might be able to create a branch around a block. But I can't create a branch around that kind of block. What's that? If you look on page 700 and 701, a closer look at athero. It's not arteriosclerosis. It's atherosclerosis. What is it? What is that? That's plaque. That's fat. Is there anything going to move through that tube very well? No. No. So what, what puts me at risk for atherosclerosis? Yeah, poor, poor diet habits. Too much <laughs> lipids trying to circulate through my circulatory system. Genetics might put me into this category as well. Cholesterol. Cholesterol always gets a bad rap. We think cholesterol is bad. It's not all that bad. It's kind of an extremely necessary component to every single cell in your body. As a matter of fact, it's so important that you make it yourself. So you don't even ever have to eat it, ever. And you'll have plenty of cholesterol. Because the lipids that you consume can be converted into cholesterol by your own body. Your liver makes it for you. But sometimes, genetics, we make too much. Sometimes we just plain eat too much. So that is the result of atherosclerosis that can cause a blockage to major blood vessels in your body. And a blockage of nutrients delivered to those cells and waste removal from those cells. And what's that's going to cause to the cells on the other side of these blockages? Death. Death. And what's a heart attack? Yeah, death of cells. Myocardial infarction. It can be for many different reasons. This is one of those reasons. But if there's any way, any reason why we're blocking delivery to, of nutrients and we're blocking removal of wastes, the cells beyond that are going to die. Yeah. Wow. Young. So there's a bunch of different risk factors. Hypertension, high pressure in the system. And this, this little guy is pretty much everywhere in the next couple of chapters we're going to talk about. Cigarette smoking. Who smokes? How much do a pack of cigarettes cost? Seven, five, six, seven. If you're really, really cheap, five, right? Very expensive habit, yes? When you look at the, the risk factors associated with your cardiovascular and respiratory system, very, very expensive habit. Yes? OK, stop smoking. Save your money. And you can come to Jamaica with me. OK? Really, you probably could. 
If you think about the money you spend on cigarettes, think about it. And think about this. This is the thing you should think about more, besides just the money you spend on them. Think about the risk factors that you are adding to your life. That. When we talk about the respiratory system, a whole bunch of wonderful little diseases that we lump under chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. If you look in the, and, and one of the things I want you to do is go look at the percentage of this in our healthcare system today and how much of it is caused from a habit we choose. Yes? So think about that next time you go to light up a cigarette. Is it really worth this? Because this is your life. We're not talking about a couple of bucks for a pack of cigarettes and, oh, you can't go to Jamaica. We're talking about this is your life. So think about that. We like you. We want you around for a long, long time. Yeah. So look at those risk factors under a closer look. All right, the next part of the chapter talks about the physiology of circulation. So basically it has to do with concentration of things, pressure of things, and movement of blood through the system. So when we talked about the pump, we talked about a cardiac cycle. We threw in some terms, systole and diastole. And what we see here is systolic and diastolic pressure which we can measure until where? We can measure the difference between the highest and the lowest pressure in the system, according to the graph, until we get into which blood vessels? No, basically the arterioles, OK? So I can measure the difference. I can feel that pressure wave running through the aorta, the best, and arteries. But once I hit the arterioles, I'm going to stop being able to distinguish the difference between high and low. And I'm going to stop feeling that pressure wave. So once I get into those small arteries. Now you see some numbers over there. Blood pressure me measured in millimeters of mercury. 120 over 80. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's the average so-called normal what? blood pressure. And what was a blood pressure? A blood pressure is a representation of the highest pressure in the system and the lowest pressure in the system. So the difference between the two can be seen in a blood pressure reading. Yes? The top one is systolic. That's the pressure that's created by what? That cr contraction of the ventricle. That's the highest pressure in the system, 120. Diastolic. Relaxation of that ventricle, that's the lowest pressure in the system, 80. So this is a representation of what we call um, deflection or differences in pressure in the system, systolic and diastolic. Now here's a little bit more math for you. So under definition of terms, we talk about blood flow, flow through the tubes, flow through the system blood pressure, that pressure that's created by the pump, systolic and diastolic. But the other thing that's going to determine how fast things move through the tubes is the resistance against the tube. So think about atherosclerosis again. If I have a nice, wide open, smooth tube, things are going to flow through it much faster, quicker, and easier the least amount of resistance. But if I start applying resistance, say instead of a smooth lining, I make it sandpaper lining, or I put a big block in there, what's going to happen to resistance in the system? It's going to increase. And increasing resistance is going to decrease flow. So under resistance on page 702, they talk about viscosity of blood. And we touched upon this a little bit when we talked about blood doping and the amount of red blood cells versus plasma in your system. If you have too many red blood cells, what's that going to do to the viscosity of your blood? It's going to make it thicker. What if I have too many plasma proteins? Thick. 
So increasing viscosity is also going to do what to flow? It's going to slow it down, decrease flow. Increase viscosity, increase resistance, decrease flow. You with me? Okay. How about the length of the blood vessels? What if I gain all that weight? I have to add more anastomoses, more blood vessels, more blood vessels. What's going to happen to the total length of the, plate, of the blood that needs to travel through these guys before it gets back to the heart? It's going to increase as well. So they talk a little bit about blood vessel length. Correct. Fit for life. Yes. Because you, you're going to stress, you can be those things, but you, you also have to accept the consequences, right? You're going to stress your tubes. You're going to stress the pump. You stress a tube, you stress the pumps. They don't last as long. Bottom line. Yes? So blood vessel diameter also is going to affect flow. Say I go to water my plants outside and I have my hose attached to my house. And I don't have one of those fancy little handles on the end, but I have a bush over there that I want to water. What am I going to do to the hose? I can put my thumb on the end and do what to the diameter of the, the lumen of the hose? You make it smaller. If it has the same pressure behind it, it's going to go, it's going to go further. Do you see what I'm, where I'm going with that? So the diameter of blood vessels can also affect the rate of flow as well. When diameter of blood vessels becomes larger, flow is going to do what? Slow down. The other thing that's going to happen is, pretend my um, hand are cells in capillary beds. When they're close together, they kind of overlap like this. Can things really move very, no, they're going to be much more controlled. But when I dilate my blood vessels, what happens to the cells? They kind of pull away from each other and, and things can escape much faster when I dilate blood vessels. Um, when you get hot, for example, what happens to the surface capillaries? They, they get wider. So what can happen? Well, not only blood, but heat, heat exchange. Remember, you've got a whole bunch of stuff in that circulatory system that's being delivered. Heat is one of them. Blood happens to be a little bit higher than your core temperature, and it's going to transmit heat as well. So they come to the surface more, and they open up wide so heat can pass. When I have an immune response, or I have um, a response that's trying to get uh, diapedesis, for example. You remember diapedesis? I cut myself. Cells come to the area. To do what? Repair, damage, get rid of any nasty little critters that might come into my cut. So if I dilate blood vessels, I'm going to allow cells to leave the circulatory system and get into that damaged area. That's why you get swelling. Redness, because who else leaves besides the cells that I want? Fluids. Fluids will pass out more freely as well. So constricting or dilating blood vessels can also have an effect on flow as well. So they give us this little formula, relationship between flow and pressure and resistance. I'm, I'm not going to make you memorize the formula, and I'm not even going to make you do any calculations based on the formula. But you should understand the basis of the information about blood flow. And blood flow, and this is all the math terms they throw in there, is inversely proportional to the peripheral resistance in systemic circulation. So flow and resistance are going to go hand in hand. When I increase resistance, I decrease flow. When I decrease resistance, I increase flow. And that's what inversely proportional means. We're going to talk inversely proportional again when we talk about Boyle's Law in the respiratory system. Systemic blood pressure then, extremely important, not only to move blood to where it has to go through the system, but also for exchange to happen. When we talk about 
wanting to be someplace or another in the molecular world. If I want to go, f and this is where I'm going when I go to Jamaica, which would you rather be in? A high pressure situation or a low pressure situation? Low pressure. I would rather be drinking my pina colada in my lounge chair, yes, than be taking a real stressful exam. Well, molecules and atoms are going to follow the same. <laughs> yeah, when you're taking your lab test, I'll think of you. <laughs> so, molecules are going to move from a high pressure to a low pressure. Pressure in this system is going to help drive the movement of molecules from one place to another. Remember, we have to have exchange in those capillary beds, but the molecules have to have a reason to want to go from one place to another. So when we talk about the dynamics of pressure in the system, it's important to remember that too high a pressure is going to drive the movement of too many molecules out of the circulatory system. Remember, those molecules have to get back into the circulatory system, and if the pressure is too high, they're not going to be able to do that. So they talk about pressure, systolic, diastolic, and then something called pulse pressure. And what is a pulse pressure? And this is where you're going to have to get your calculator out again. Pulse pressure, anybody know? The difference between somebody saying it, yeah, systolic and diastolic pulse. There's also something called mean arterial pressure. And mean arterial pressure isn't quite me the mean that we think of. Because mean arterial pressure, we have to think of the fact that we have higher pressure, systolic pressure, and lower pressure to deal with. So it's not quite an average. And mean arterial pressure is calculated by taking the diastolic pressure and adding pulse pressure divided by three. That calculation can be seen on page 703 in your textbook. So I will, and this is where your calculator is going to come in, you will see that you will have to calculate things like mean arterial pressure. What else do you have to calculate? Uh, cardiac output and we just mentioned the other one, pulse pressure. So write those down it's in your, I have to know how to calculate this side of your notes. So that's the list so far. Cardiac output, pulse pressure, mean arterial pressure. So as blood moves through the arterial system, you see a sudden drop as the tubes start getting smaller. So in the arterioles and in the capillary beds, pressure goes down significantly. <coughs> so capillary pet pressure is much, much lower than we see in the arteries. Venous blood pressure is even lower. By the time blood gets to the vena cavus, it's basically under no pressure at all. The only reason it's moving is why? Because everybody's getting, it's getting a push from behind. So pressure drops down to zero by the time blood dumps back into the heart through the vena cavas. Where is it going to dump back into the heart? The right atria. Yes? So pressure is at zero once it gets there. So what is it that's moving things through the venous system? Again, these other guys are helping to get blood back to the heart. So don't forget about the muscles. The muscular pump, and you can see this figure on page 704, figure 19.7, is going to help get blood back by pushing on those tubes and adding a little bit more pressure to move blood along. The valves, of course, are going to help as well. They're going to help prevent what? Backflow. They also talk about the respiratory pump, and that's you just breathing in and out and pushing against some of those major tubes that run up the back 
that are servicing your lower limbs. And then we have something called sympathetic venoconstriction. What's sympathetic? Yeah, speeding up. This is the autonomic nervous system. So we actually have the autonomic nervous system giving little jolts every once in a while to the venous system to help get blood back to the heart. <clears throat> so there's a lot of different things that are going to help monitor and maintain pressure in the system. Maintaining blood pressure is extremely important for exchange. It's also important because too much pressure in the system is going to wear the system out faster. And this is the problem with things like cigarette smoking and obesity. We're going to have an effect on the pump and the tubes, and we're going to have an effect on things like the respiratory system because of this high pressure. The respiratory system, cardiovascular system, kind of work hand in hand because remember, half the heart is the pulmonary pump, yes? So half the heart's responsible for getting blood to the lungs for oxygenation and deoxygenation of blood. So exercise can affect pressure in the system. Because why? <clears throat> blood has to pump harder. We have more muscles contracting, creating more pressure in the system. So muscular pump, skeletal muscles, the respiratory system is going to call for what? More oxygen when I'm moving. So we're going to get more of that sympathetic venoconstriction during exercise. That's going to increase venous return and increase, what's that little three letters there? End diastolic volume. What was that? We talked about that during cardiac cycle. Yeah, and diastolic volume is the amount of what? The blood that's left after contraction. Volume after contraction, diastole. Yes? That's going to increase stroke volume, increase the amount of blood that is pushed out during diastole. What's that going to do to stroke volume? Increase stroke volume. Increase stroke volume, what do you do to cardiac output? Increase cardiac output. So blood pressure is going to be monitored by pre uh, places in the medulla oblongata. And the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, with the help of the endocrine system, are going to help regulate pressure in the system. So if I increase contractility of cardiac muscle, I'm going to increase end diastolic volume and decrease end systolic volume. Push out more so there's not as much left during relaxation. So you got a little confused there with the end diastolic volume. End diastolic volume is what? The volume of blood that you're doing what? pushing out during diastole. And systolic volume is the amount of blood that's left. Yes? Make sense? Again, that's going to affect stroke volume and affect cardiac output. So neural controls are going to play a role in regulating pressure in the system. And this is a nice little diagram to look at to help tie all of those factors together. This is on page 705, figure 19.8. So neural controls are going to help regulate pressure in the system by helping to either increase contractility, dilate or constrict blood vessels. Who else is going to help with um, regulating pressure in the system besides the nervous system? What do you think? Besides who we see in, in there, if I add something very quickly back into the circulatory system, I can increase volume very quickly. Water. 
who else is going to come into play with respect to regulating blood pressure in the system besides these guys in this diagram? Water. Water. Who regulates water in the system? Kidneys, the renal system. So some of these hormones have an effect on reabsorption rate in the kidneys. Add more water to the system, add more pressure. Get rid of more water in the system, lower pressure. Yes? So the kidneys are going to play a role in pressure regulation as well. So they talk a little bit about the role of the cardiovascular centers. These centers regulating either sympathetic or parasympathetic activities that are going to help regulate blood pressure in the system. So on page 706, figure 19.9, .9, we see baroreceptors, reflexes that help maintain blood pressure homeostasis. Um, yeah, that's a good essay question. Yeah, yeah, of come on guys, that's right. <laughs> don't help her. I don't need any help, believe me. So we have we um, we have pressure receptors in the system that are constantly monitoring pressure throughout the system. Well, we have ones in the central nervous system. That's a that's a no brainer. <laughs> <laughs> but we also have some receptors right in the area where, where the pressure is, is at most. So when we talk about in the aorta, in the aortic arch, we actually have receptors there that can pick up a change in pressure right at the beginning where that push happens. <clears throat> so we see pressure receptors or baroreceptors right in the carotid sinuses in the aortic arch that can actually send messages, hormonal messages, to the central nervous system that something's going on with pressure. So pressure increases in this case, and I'm looking at the top of this diagram. Sympathetic impulses to the heart cause a decrease in heart rate and a decrease in contractility and a decrease in, that's not carbon dioxide, what is that? Cardiac output. Another thing that's going to be affected by some of these changes, hormonal changes, is the diameter of blood vessels. So if I want to increase pressure in the system, what should I do to the diameter of a blood vessel? Make it smaller. If I want to decrease, make it bigger. Yes? So vasoconstriction and vasodilation, vasodilation in this case, is going to help to decrease pressure in the system. So by the time we get around, we're going to decrease cardiac output and decrease R. What's R? Resistance. Return blood pressure to homeostatic range. Well, what happens when the opposite happens? Because high blood pressure can be a pain in the keister, but low <laughs> blood pressure can be just as bad. Remember, I need incentive to go from high pressure to low pressure. I don't have any incentive. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying with the low pressure, right? So if there's too low a pressure in the system, what's going to happen to exchange in the capillary beds? It's going to go way, way down. It's not going to be enough. So decreased pressure in the system can be just as much of a problem. So the stimulus in this case for our feedback mechanism, and hopefully by now you realize that's what we are going through, when we have decreased blood pressure in the system, those baroreceptors are also going to pick up the message as well. Going to send messages to those little regions in the brain, the medulla oblongata. You're going to tell the heart, and we have brain things that communicate with the heart, don't we? The, oh, yes, cranial nerve who? Ten, the vagus nerve. Sympathetic impulses to the heart cause an increase in heart rate, an increase in contractility, which will result in an increase of cardiac output. What am I going to do to my little blood vessels in this case? When I want to increase resistance, I'm going to constrict those little suckers. 
and I'm going to increase cardiac output, increase resistance, and return blood pressure to homeostatic ranges. So there's a whole bunch of things that are going on to help maintain and regulate blood pressure in the system, and you should understand that. This diagram will help you understand that. Yes? High, low. Some of the different hormones you already know. Epinephrine and norepinephrine. What are they going to do to blood pressure? Increase blood pressure by increasing cardiac output, heart rate, and contractility. You can read just as well as I can. Know these guys and what they do to the heart and the contractility with respect to blood pressure. So there's also chemoreceptors in the body, chemical changes. Um, oxygen, for example, chemoreceptors in the central nervous system are going to pick up information with respect to oxygen content. When oxygen content goes down, what's the cardiovascular system going to do? Speed up, yes? So chemoreceptors are going to help. And high, um, higher brain centers are going to help regulate cardiac output based on different chemicals associated with that stimulus. So short-term regulation and hormonal controls is talked about in your textbook on page 707. The adrenal medulla hormones, again, epinephrine, norepinephrine, angiotensin 2, ANP, what's that? Atrial natriuretic peptide, and that's going to help uh, regulate kidney stuff. Remember, the kidney is also associated with regulation of pressure. Antidiuretic hormone, what's that doing for me? So we get this diagram here on page 708, and we see direct renal mechanisms and indirect renal mechanisms. And remember, I told you we were going to talk about renin and angiotensin, right? We know what they do for a living, right? What are they going to do for a living? Uh, you already know what they do for a living because you already had a test on what they do for a living. And still there's silence. That, that was the part you didn't get? Okay. Well, now look, at, now look at this diagram, and maybe it'll jog your memory a little bit. Pressure goes down in the system. What do I want to do? How? And how are they going to do that? Yeah, here's my water regulators. Here, here's the guys that are going to have an effect on those kidneys. So increased renin release from the kidneys is going to set off this renin-angiotensin pathway. That renin is going to stimulate the angiotensinogen to convert into angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2. So it's like one of those little cascades of chemical events. And that's going to have an effect eventually on water. Increased sodium reabsorption by the kidneys is going to result in increased water reabsorption by the kidneys. We, we mentioned this a while back. Obligatory water reabsorption. Remember when I mentioned that? I said we were going to talk about it again. When charged particles flow from one place to another, Water is a polar molecule, right? It's got a slightly positive, slightly negative end, and that charged particle is going to do what to water? Attract it. So when it gets reabsorbed back into the circulatory by the system, uh, by the kidneys, excuse me, water is going to follow. We'll add more water to the system. Water reabsorption. You're also going to get a little what? Yeah. So to help increase water intake. That's going to help increase blood volume. And the bottom line is you're going to increase mean arterial pressure. So understand this diagram. 
long-term regulation of renal mechanisms. <gasps> the diagrams are like crazy in this chapter. But if you take the time to look at them and follow them down and understand what's going on, this stuff is going to make so much more sense. So look at what's happening at the top. And these are the factors that increase mean arterial pressure. Increase pressure in the system when it does what? Go down. Think of what you have to do. If I want to increase pressure in the system, I have to do what? The, the fastest thing I can do is call on the kidneys and increase blood volume by increasing water. The other thing, if I have an effect on the diameter of blood vessels, I have an effect on resistance. And this is a place where I'm going to stop. So here's the deal. Um, the next part of the book talks about pulse, basically a pressure wave. Understand what measuring blood pressure is. What is pulse versus blood pressure? When I come back to class, we are going to start with um, chapter 20. But the one thing I'm going to do is let you know that the end of this chapter is about page 720. Okay? We're not going to go into the rest of the chapter that talks about all of the different pathways that the circulatory system takes. We're not going to do that in this class. We're going to talk about main artery pathways and main vein pathways. And guess where that's going to happen? It's going to happen in lab. So just a heads up, page 725, table 19.4. Know it. It's going to be on your lab exam, next lab exam. The other one is page 737. You should kind of know that too. Only the arteries is going to be on your lab exam. Maybe the veins. I don't know. So start learning those too. Yeah? You didn't click in? Okay, everybody um, do another click or click in. So the quiz, I'll put the, the rest of this lecture online, and I will open up the quiz for Chapter 19 on Thursday. Just click in anything. It's fine. So we will finish... Well, the online um, lecture will finish Chapter 19. Remember, only up to page 720. We're not going to go on from there, so it's not that much more. Did everybody click in? Oh, everybody's favorite letter is A. Yes, ma'am. Are you sure I can take it Thursday, the lab practical? Because I can take it today, but 